Hello, everybody. This is uh, Representative Joe Sosnowski, uh, representing the 69th District, which covers uh, Winnebago County and Boone County. And uh, we wanted to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're doing a uh, Zoom interview here um, with uh, Mrs. Patempo from Swedish American, I'm sorry, <laughs> with Mercy Health <laughs> in Rockford, <laughs> Illinois. Um, I'm in big trouble after that introduction. No, you're OK. Um, <laughs> But do you do you want to take just a, a quick second to introduce yourself and a little bit about you? Um, yes, I am Deb Patempa from Mercy Health, um, and I've been with the Mercy Health System for ten years. Um, a lot of my uh, earlier years with Mercy Health was in the Wisconsin market, and came to Rockford um, a little over a year ago, um, just before uh, the hospital opened here, just or right after the hospital opened. And so um, we're, we're continuing to forge through the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I think that's what we're here to talk about today. Well, thank you so much for, for being a part of us, uh, this uh, Zoom uh, interview. We've done a handful of these and uh, we found that um, it's very uh, informative. I think uh, obviously people have a lot of questions. Uh, a lot of their news is coming from national sources. And so we like the opportunity to have, um, you know, kind of a regional focus and, and answer some questions. And, and we had a couple of questions that we just wanted to uh, toss out to you just from, um, uh, you know, a local regional uh, medical response and, and capacity. And, um, you know, just to start off, could, could you comment a little bit on the, uh, you know, what we're seeing locally here in Winnebago County with infection rates um, and demand on our, our hospital systems? Sure. Um, I actually just checked the Winnebago website this morning. Their data is of uh, effect, is it's up to date as of yesterday, May 3rd. Um, so in Winnebago County, we've had 562 positive tests out of a total of 6,320. Now, some of those we're still waiting um, results on, but um, that represents about 8.8% um, of those cases that we are testing. Um, are positive in Winnebago County. And in Winnebago County, we have tested just about 2% of the total population. So um, you know, our infection prevention uh, physicians feel like um, there are opportunities for us to know a little bit more the more we test. Um, about 25% of patients that are COVID positive are asymptomatic. So there are patients that are sitting out there in the community and we don't know that they're positive. So that's why it's important as we move through this pandemic that our focus should be on testing as many people as possible. Okay. Um, you know, speaking of uh, precautions, um, what are uh, things as a medical provider, uh, is Mercy Health uh, recommending to people? Any, anything over and above what is current state guidelines or CDC guidelines? Um, nothing what's over and above, but it's always good to remind people because, you know, as this goes on, people get kind of get tired of uh, being real vigilant about um, being precautionary. And this absolutely is a time not to really let down your guard. Um, certainly everyone has to, uh, you know, take a common sense approach to how they're going to live their life, but it's still extremely important to maintain the social distancing. There are a lot of our uh, stores and other um, public facilities that actually have marks on the floors to let you know what the traffic pattern should be and that's so that people are not crossing each other and maybe coughing or, or spreading droplets on each other. So that's really important uh, to follow those patterns. Uh, some of us don't even, aren't even aware that they're there, but if you look, a lot of places have them. Um, wearing a mask, that's uh, recommended now by our governor for everyone to wear a mask in public. And that's really important because the more of us that are masked, the higher our protection becomes, even if it's a cloth mask from home. Because um, our masks that we wear in public are to stop the droplets from coming from our nose and mouth. And so if I'm wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, that just doubly protects both of us from one another and, and the community from spread. So that's still really important. Um, it still is important to uh, make sure that you're doing very rigorous hand washing all the time. 
Um, people are still recommending that you might wipe down things that you bring into your home, wipe down your groceries before you put them in your cabinet. Um, you know, some of our infection prevention physicians are recommending that packages and pieces of mail, if you can't wipe them down, let them sit outside for, for a day or sit in your garage. Um, the most important thing is not to touch your face and nose. And that's hard for all of us. And so reminding each other to stop it, <laughs> if you see somebody doing that is probably, um, you know, a good one of those, I've got your back kind of things. Yeah, I always uh, tell people from, from a non-medical layman standpoint, uh, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and don't cough on other people, right? And that's kind of right. a, the great advice for uh, any sickness that spreads uh, virally. It is, it is. Um, you know, just to uh, piggyback on that question a little bit, you know, Mercy Health uh, obviously represents uh, facilities in multiple states, and different states have different uh, precautions that they put into effect. Um, uh, any uh, suggestions navigating that, or maybe uh, any difficulties from your standpoint navigating that? Uh, because neighboring states of Illinois don't have requirements. Um, they're suggested for face masks and things like that. Uh, yet Illinois has required it. Uh, some states like Iowa and Indiana are beginning to be more flexible as far as openings, 25% um, capacity in restaurants, you know, social distancing, uh, masks for employees, you know, so there's a variety, obviously, of patchwork, uh, knowing that there's 50 different states. Um, any, any difficulties from a medical standpoint navigating kind of those different rules and regulations and how different states are opening uh, at different levels? You know, we do, we, we operate between Wisconsin and Illinois, and they haven't been too, too terribly divergent on, um, you know, the, re the recommendations or restrictions that they've had. And because we're a system, we do have physicians and nurses that do travel across the state lines. So our approach has been to try to uh, take a system approach and try to maintain things similar in all of our facilities. Um, and because Illinois has been uh, perhaps a little more strict in timelines and in requirements, we've tended to take that approach across our system. Um, for example, um, opening to uh, some elective surgeries and procedures. We, we did approach that at the same time. Um, and because our, our Personal protective equipment is one of the factors that kind of um, dictates how much surgery we'll be able to do. And as a system, we do pool those resources. So we have to look at um, cases and number of um, positive patients that we're treating in all of our hospitals in order to determine the burn rate of our masks and our gowns and, and those. So we've approached it you know, sort of assist, as a system. Um, we have opened up to some elective cases very slowly and carefully. We have, uh, um, the way that we've approached it is we have uh, committees, surgical committees in each of our hospitals made up of the surgeons, anesthesiologists, administration, nursing, and they've written their guidelines um, uh, for who would be a candidate, how do we reach out to those patients, what are the things that we're going to require patients to have done prior to, for instance, they all will have to have a COVID test. Uh, they all will have to be screened the day of. They can bring one visitor with them, and that person also will need to be screened for temperature and symptoms, masked. Um, so, you know, we think we've, we've taken a pretty... Um, um, a pretty good approach across the system and, and we're very careful. We have a call every morning that we talk about as a system, how many COVID patients do we have? How many cases are we getting ready to do in the, in the operating room? What is our bed situation like? What's our PPE situation like? And each day we, um, you know, we monitor what we'll do um, the next day and the following weeks. We um, have, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Well, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that we've just started to address, you know, in, in light of Illinois requiring all of us to be masked that are in public places, we're now um, addressing our patients who are actually in the hospital. And if they're, um, you know, on their road to recovery, they're up in the hallways walking, 
um, we are going to be providing masks for them. You know, that's difficult too because you don't want to cut into the PPE for the caregivers. So we've had, we have wonderful volunteers uh, in our health system and volunteers in the community that have been sewing cloth masks for us as I'm sure um, a lot of the other health systems have had as well. And those are the masks that we're using to, um, to give our patients. You know, um, and so that brings up, your comments bring up two questions. So as follow up, um, in regards to PPE, anecdotally we hear or have heard, I think it's gotten better uh, of shortages. Um, and nobody, of course, has a stockpile of months and months, it doesn't seem. Um, but just on a, an operating basis, uh, Mercy Health and your system, um, uh, if you, I don't know if you have it, exact burn rates or, you know, how much supplies do you have? I mean, do you, do you have a week's worth or month's worth or do you feel like you're adequate at this point and able to handle um, any surge that could happen? You know, I don't know the numbers on how many weeks we have available. Um, every piece has its own burn rate and its own kind of calculation for how much we do have of it. Um, we have a supply chain vice president who, uh, you know, is really on top of this, uh, working with the emergency management system, working with the county, the state, the federal government. Um, we put in orders uh, based on what we feel like we need. Some, as you know, sometimes you get deliveries and sometimes you don't. Sometimes the deliveries you get are things that really um, you didn't ask for or they turn out to be uh, you can't use them because they're either expired or um, they're not of the, the quality that you would expect for, for our, our partners to use um, in surgery or in a COVID room. Um, we, um, so we, we don't have anything today that we say we're really, really worried about running out of. What we do have a concern about today, as I say, every week is different, is testing supplies um, um, for testing for COVID. Uh, we want to test more patients, of course, and we are testing more because we are opening up to some elective uh, cases. And that seems to be difficult for us to get. Um, so testing supplies, and then oddly enough, uh, bouffant, what they call bouffant caps, surgical caps, um, you know, those kind of green caps that you see surgeons wearing, um, those have been in short supply. We're not out of them, but we have to really keep up close eye on them. Every day is different, but so sure. far, so but far, whoever, we're, limping, yeah, we're limping along. Whoever's in that purchasing department, I'm sure they're, they're earning their paycheck for the, the last couple of months. Um, and that's important, I think, for any listeners uh, that will hear this broadcast later. Um, we've had calls to my office, nursing homes, and some others. Uh, um, uh, some people have just, uh, you know, on social media, they well, we're all out of supplies. And and we've made some outreach to a handful of facilities. And really, we've found that there are limited supplies, but uh, through the county health departments or local uh, hospitals, they've been able to get the supplies that they need to operate on a weekly basis. Uh, and sometimes, they're like you said, they're not as readily available, but um, it seems like the situation, at least in our areas, seems to be under control. Um, I want to get back to elective surgeries. Uh, you touched on it. Um, so in particular, um, I know we've gotten calls, uh, you know, folks that put everything on hold, uh, surgeries that are important to have, but uh, they've been put on the wait list. And I know you mentioned that there's a committee that evaluates that. Um, so for the Rockford region, though, would we expect through, through Mercy Health that uh, more and more elective surgeries based off of uh, space in the hospital would become available for those patients who kind of were waiting to get those scheduled? That is our goal, yes. Uh, our goal is to be able to do it safely, both for our uh, employees and for patients. Um, and, and safely means making sure we have the appropriate PPE. Um, of course, all of us uh, in healthcare have changed the way we do things. So the way that you clean an operating room, the way that you um, clean a, a waiting area. Sometimes there are no waiting areas. Sometimes if, we, if we're able to, patients are actually waiting in their cars for some of their appointments and then we'll call them in um, so that they can just get right in and not wait. So, you know, business is different today than it was five months ago. And honestly, we're not sure if, ever, if things are ever gonna be back to the way they were before. Um, you know, it just depends on how this all plays out. But 
Um, yes, we are, our physicians have actually been working on a plan for probably five or six weeks because, you know, as physicians and nurses, they, they know that patients have been sitting at home getting sicker, um, you know, maybe requiring more pain medication than, um, than, you know, they would have had they had their surgery behind them. And, um, and that's an issue that we don't want to have to, you know, create another problem around that. So um, we are concerned, I think, all of us across the country, physicians and nurses, about what's happening to our patients who aren't coming to the hospital and aren't coming to the clinics. Now, our clinics are opening as well um, based on need. We're doing a lot of telemedicine when we can because that makes sense, you know, if it's um, a checkup or something. But if somebody really needs to be seen, uh, we are opening up our clinics for that. But um, it's not that all of a sudden the country didn't need emergency care and isn't sick. And so, you know, in the, in the beginning of this, I think we were at a third capacity um, from our normal business. And so you wonder where are those people? They're at home, you know, afraid to come to the hospital. So I think um, an important message for us to get out is that our hospitals and clinics are safe places. We are very careful. We're good at this. This is our core business to uh, monitor infection and to put protocols in place that keep um, our patients and all of the folks that are caring for our patients and taking care of our buildings. Uh, our envi environmental service workers are so important in this whole process and um, you know they're, they're the heroes too that are keeping us really, really safe. So um, it is for as long as we can ensure that we can do this safely and we have enough PPE for the frontline folks that are caring for COVID positive patients, we want to be able to take care as many of our keep take care of as many of our patients as we can. Oh, that's great. And um, in regards to a start date on electives, um, do you have one tentatively set uh, for Mercy Health? And then, I mean, can you give maybe a, uh, a couple examples of the types of most likely um, surgeries that would start uh, again? Or is well, it the, governor, the, the governor's spectrum? allowing us, to, yes, the governor's allowing us to start surgeries. Um, and so uh, we have what we, what we would call a soft, um, uh, plan this week. Uh, these are patients that the surgeons have all um, gone into, you know, their um, uh, their lists and looked at patients that, first of all, um, are not likely to need uh, a hospital bed. So we would like to start with patients who we can bring in, and it's an outpatient surgery. Now, remember, all through the pandemic, though, there have been patients coming in who need emergent surgery and might need to go to an intensive care bed. So we've been, we've been really working at this throughout the duration, but for electives, we wanna start with those cases that are shorter maybe, and um, patients will be able to go home. Um, we certainly want to avoid cases that are gonna be requiring intensive care until we're sure that we are not gonna need our intensive care beds for any of the the um, pandemic, you know, if we continue to have a little bit of a surge like we're seeing now. Um, but certainly, again, if those patients need to have their surgery, we will do that. So that's really the approach. Every specialty is looking at, you know, who is safe for them to bring in. Um, sure. eye, sure. eye cases, children that need tubes in their ears, those are shorter cases. Some of our orthopedic cases um, is where we're starting this week. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I misphrased that. My question meant uh, exactly what you answered with elective surgeries because um, hey, I think a lot of people, um, and I sometimes run into individuals and in clarifying information that's on the Illinois Department of Health and they look at hospital capacity and they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, you know, they're at 50% capacity. Well, that's because hospitals are busy um, with serious issues all the time. And I, you know, I try to help in perspective and I'll mention these facts here. I don't, you know, I had a conversation with uh, Winnebago County and the coroner's office just over the last week. And, you know, a lot of people maybe don't think about it, especially since the news has been so focused on COVID. But, you know, within the Winnebago region, you know, I think we've had approximately uh, 1,000 to 1,100 deaths that have happened. Um, 
in our area. And of course, every life is important. It's very unfortunate. But, you know, if it's a car accident or cardiovascular issues, um, natural age, um, you know, so those are all things that hospitals are dealing with on a regular basis. And I think sometimes people hear the statistics about COVID and they think, well, nothing else is happening. But, you know, obviously in a country of 330 million people, um, I believe we average about 2 million deaths a year. And so COVID is not number one on that list, but, you know, obviously, uh, you know, as an infectious disease, something that we definitely need to pay attention to. Um, just to um, dig into just a little bit more detail, I think you mentioned uh, at the beginning of the local uh, pandemic response, uh, I think you mentioned a third was your capacity uh, that was, was filled. Um, where is the, your hospital system right now? Um, you said you might have seen a little bit of an uptick just recently. Um, can you give us just a kind of a broad stroke on percentage or generally where, where your capacity is at versus what you would normally see? We are uh, today between our two hospitals, our Rockton and Riverside campus, we are about 54, 55% uh, occupied of our total capacity. Um, now we we have added, um, you know, as as you start putting your plans together for the state for the response to a pandemic, all of us, all of the health systems, put together plans for what other additional beds can you or have you been able to create that you could quickly open if we went into a surge capacity. So. Over and above our regular beds um, that I just mentioned to you, we, we have been able to be um, very creative uh, about additional space. We opened a COVID unit um, in space that was not currently occupied uh, you know, for the general patient population. We opened that about five weeks ago, and that's been our first COVID unit. Um, and it's really been um, a great, a great space for us because we can maintain critical, critically ill patients and then um, patients who are not as critical all in the same location. And so the staff has been able to stay in that area um, for the most part. Now, as, as the numbers start to increase, um, we do have to use our negative pressure rooms in other locations in our Rockton campus. We've tried to um, keep the majority of our COVID positive patients on our Rockton campus. Um, and today we're getting to that point where we might have to open a second COVID unit. We're kind of, you know, um, it's like, you know, hour by hour, depending on the number of patients that we see. And we know in Rockford, our three health systems, all three of us are seeing increases in COVID um, patient volume. So um, we do have the capacity for about another 20 or so patients, COVID patients, in some other um, space that we've identified. It's set up, it's ready to go um, if we need to. We hope we don't have to do that, but. Okay, and so when you were talking about uh, the almost 50%, it was, I think you said 54 to 55% um, of hospital rooms are taken. So roughly 50% still available and then, there's still extra space that you're identifying as additional expansion. Yes, if we needed to, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, just from conversations, uh, I don't know if the, the three hospital systems uh, trade numbers or kind of coordinate that in response to COVID, uh, are those numbers similar uh, to the other systems, do you think, or do you know an answer to that? I don't know the answer, but they do, um, they do talk. Uh, Dr. Dorsey represents Mercy Health. Um, and then the other two systems, I believe the mayor um, and um, maybe uh, Dr. Martel, they meet a daily and talk okay. about the situation in each of the hospitals. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, I really want to appreciate it. We've kind of reached the 30 minute mark. Um, and so I wow. wanted to, they, it was quick, uh, but yeah, I wanted what? to thank you for your time. Uh, again, I'm State Representative Joe Sosnowski, and we have uh, uh, Deb Pantepo uh, from uh, Mercy Health System, one of our great hospitals here uh, locally in the Rockford region, but they serve uh, more than just Illinois. And I just want to thank you so much for, for being a part of us, uh, this presentation today. But I wanted to give you a couple minutes if you have any closing comments, totally up to you. Uh, but uh, if you have anything that you wanted to say to our viewers that we didn't cover uh, or any question that I might have missed. 
No, it's been great. Um, thank you for having me. I, I'm proud to be uh, to be in the Rockford region, certainly Winnebago County um, and, uh, and our state have um, done a great job about keeping everyone informed. As you mentioned, uh, we're not running out of anything. So we seem to be able to find a way to get the things that we need. And you know, that's, um, that's key and very much appreciated. I think we have a great um, collaborative uh, uh, county and state and um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, thank you so much. And I think the residents of Winnebago can be proud uh, of Mercy Health. You guys do a great job and, uh, and the response to this has been fantastic. Uh, please give our, our love and best wishes to everybody working in the health facilities there. Um, and just our heart goes out to them and we just thank them for all that they do to serve our community. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks so much and thanks for being with us today. Have a all great right. day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye -bye.